Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, whatever time zone you're in, welcome. My name is Tony Horn. For the last few years, and probably I'll qualify that by saying since 2016, one thing has been on my mind frequently and constantly. And that is the way that we represent death in the media. Hashtag RIP, Wikipedia, telling the world that you're dead before really your family have laid you to rest. In 2016, many iconic famous people that we felt close to passed away from David Bowie to Prince and many, many others for whom I cannot do justice at this moment. It has been on my mind that people who pay tribute to those we have lost, perhaps if they genuinely knew that person, should take a little bit more time and be a bit more withdrawn and those people who are truly hurting at someone's loss should perhaps take a back step and pay tribute later but the demands of rolling news and the desire now to influence people and be first on social media means that we all get sucked in i despise the notion that in 140 characters or as Twitter, I think, has extended that. You can do justice to somebody who's lived a life. Hashtag RIP, insert name, I think is one of the most disrespectful and disgraceful things I've ever seen, and I will never use it. As I begin this podcast today, I need to expand a little bit more on its origins. I turned 50 this year and in the last five to 10 years, I've seen many people who frankly should outlive me leave this planet. From my own father in South America to Lisa Shaw uh, in the Northeast with whom I worked every day for three years at the start of her career. Good friends like Simon Nix, Nixie, um, a broadcaster of some repute across many radio stations. And if you know anything about me, of course, you'll understand my association with the late PC David Rathbam. I am at that age where people are starting to say goodbye and it hurts every single time. A newspaper obituary column a ticker tape on Sky News, a Wikipedia entry and a hashtag. Just don't cut it for me. And I've therefore been toying for four years with the notion that I might do a podcast. It seems that every week somebody that we respect, know, has walked into our lives, passes away, but equally that shouldn't be part of the criteria. There are many people who have not walked into our lives, who demand respect, consideration and reflection. Perhaps they invented something that's every day in your life and you don't even know their name. Perhaps they're overseas and their acts of kindness have never reach these shores through our news media. You just don't know. One thing is for certain, we're all going to go. And we never have any say in how our own death is written up. This is playing on my mind increasingly and came to a fore this week. As I speak, it is the 9th of October 2021. I'm recording this at 21.30 UK time. 
I've lost a dear friend this week. Cards on the table. I haven't seen him for some time. Cards on the table again. That's also the mark of the strength of our relationship. I live in the north of England. He lived in the south. He worked in London and Northern Ireland. It didn't matter. We met on my first day at university, almost 32 years to the day that I am recording this. From those origins, the good times of being a student, your connection is deep rooted. You don't have to call somebody every day, every week. You can go a couple of years without speaking to somebody. If your relationship has the integrity and honesty that ours did, then it's okay. Of course, now I've lost my friend. I regret all those moments when I said we must meet up and never did. So consider this podcast today a pilot, if you like. I'd like to continue it. Time is against us. <laughs> yeah, there's no greater truth as we discuss death, is there? And you may well say this is a little bit morbid, but there's a market for everything. And one thing that I've learned through the people that I've lost is it's really important to be able to see the light side of the dark side. So as we remember people, we must deliberately effect, effect with an E, the emotion. We must bring into force the reaction from you that makes you cry and makes you laugh. So today I'm going to give this a go and I'm going to speak about my friend James Brokenshaw, MP 53. I know stuff about James that you will never know. That's simply because we were very close friends and we shared moments that are me and James moments. It's not to say there's anything there that can't be told in an open forum, but we had a relationship that, of course, involved just me and him. In time, I watched and beamed from afar as James shone in government. Theresa May, the former Prime Minister, thought very highly of him, as did David Cameron. She entrusted him with the big job of Northern Ireland. One thing that always makes me smile is that when James was in hospital with lung cancer, after this first diagnosis, he rang me to tell me that he'd had a card from Gerry Adams. And when you grow up in mainland England with the IRA and a school friend of mine lost his father, to the IRA so it's something that you're both aware of and touch me personally and then you find that one of your dearest friends has received a card from Jerry Adams it tests the emotions but it makes me smile but James was that kind of person that he was able to appeal to so many people he was driven without driving people off the road he could bring you hard news tough stuff you didn't want to hear as a friend good advice and do so with a smile he was my go-to person if i needed legal advice or just an opinion about something that he knew nothing he would always give me common sense he never stopped smiling and he never stopped loving and he never stopped giving from the very first moment i met him he said to me at the steps of devonshire house on the university of exeter campus what do you want to do and I said, I want to do everything. I want to run this place. I'm referring to the student radio station, University Radio Exeter. He said, well, I do a travel program. And I said, well, I've been to Peru and Colombia and I've just been a campsite courier for Canvas holidays. And he said, well, I'm recording in the next few hours. And I said, count me in. And from that, in a world where people wanted to be disc jockeys, playing black box, right on time, the number one for an eternity, or reading the news at a time 
at the back end of the 80s when disasters were aplenty and fronted the bulletins from Hillsborough, of course. That very same year, Zeebrugge, Heysel, Miner's Strike, Royal Weddings. The 80s was a very, very rich time for news content. No wonder people rocked up at Exeter's award-winning student radio station wanting to report it. I just wanted to be near it. I had no aspirations to go on to have the career that I had in terms of fronting morning shows in the United Kingdom for 20 years or so. I just wanted to be near radio, which is why when James said to me, well, I do a travel show, I said, count me in. And I can see the scene in the studio, by the way, the very first time we recorded. I had a seven minute monologue written about an experience in Peru from a couple of years before. I'd never broadcast ever. Hospital radio had rejected me. Yes, they sometimes do. Mike Penny, a person I must mention, was, as we say, driving the desk. That means pressing the buttons. James was sat next to me in the, st in the studio. We didn't know each other at all. I began my monologue with the instruction to fade up the Peruvian music and fade it out at the end. Three weeks in the third world, I began, and every day could have been my last. At the end, James shook my hand and said, wow, that was amazing. It was okay. But from there, our friendship grew. Our bond inseparable. And myself, James Brokenshire, and Nick Thatcher, a dear, dear friend, would spend hours just hanging out. And having worked in professional radio for all these years, one thing that doesn't happen anymore is people just don't hang out at the radio station. The university radio station at Exeter was predictably underneath the Ram bar. It was perfect for hanging out. We were discovering playing music on the radio for the very first time and talking in between what was not to love. Through our friendship and our bond of having to do a radio show every week, uh, a concept itself that can both divide and unite. Fierce rivalries exist in the medium, but deep friendships can too. James and I, of course, drunk together, talked about love together, went to his parents' house in Cornwall together and listened as England beat the West Indies in 1990 with Wayne Larkins and Graham Gooch and Alex Stewart and Nasser Hussein on their first tours, I believe. We listened to the radio in the car as Delamitri's Nothing Ever Happens came on and thought, wow, what a song. And then when it got to the line, Americans snap up Van Gogh's for the price of a hospital wing, Steve Wright came on and went, what a line. And whilst Steve is correct, we both looked at each other and knew that the moment had been ruined. There is a great element of life when somebody introduces you to a piece of music that becomes special to you, that person becomes special too. James and myself did not introduce each other to Delamitri, but we had that shared collective experience of listening to Nothing Ever Happens for the first time together. At the end of my first term at Exeter University, which would be Christmas 1989, I spent New Year on James's kitchen floor. There I met his great mate, Johnny, and I saw a window of his future as I realized they were young conservatives. James was training to be a lawyer. He would graduate that following summer and I would go to Italy for a year to study Italian, in theory, although I didn't really. Of course we stayed in touch. That university experience is so important to so many people in the friendships and the bonds that it forms. And here I am, 32 years later, recounting it to you and wondering 
how did we get here so fast? In the years that James became an MP and a minister, I really kind of, I don't want to say backed off because that implies perhaps that our friendship was less real, but he was a busy man and I was a busy man and we're all too busy, aren't we? I was pushing for my career and James was becoming the figure that the public have paid tribute to in their droves. But they do pay tribute to a public figure that they knew through the public eye. I'm really grateful that I've got this opportunity to share some experiences of the man that I knew before all of that started. I went to London, I don't know when it would be, but it would be sometime after July 2012. I had just written the late PC David Rathband's memoir, Tango 190. It's extraordinary how over time, people that I knew, loved and worked with also walked into James's life without any introduction. So he knew the late David Rathband as well. He knew my good friend Paul Chantler too. And in these moments of grief that we are now sharing, uh, we come together with separate experiences of James for the collective memory. But I went to London, I think I had a book meeting, and whenever I went to London, I would always message my close friends saying I was coming to town. And many people would say, we must get together. But do you know what? It was always James that would come and meet me. And here he was, an MP, having high power meetings. Um, we're just standing in the street having a pint. And he was James. It could have been Exeter in 1990, but it happened to be London 20 odd years later. He was the same person that I met. And I think that's the mark of integrity. And I think it's one of the great tributes you can pay to somebody that whilst we must all evolve and we must all learn, they never changed in the way that they were to you. As my life took turns for the worse, there was one person that I could always ring and that would be James. And often he couldn't take the call, of course, but he would always return it. And when my phone would ring at half past 10 at night, I would joke and go, who's that? Oh yeah, it's the home office and it would be James. And he provided me with so much life experience and I've, had a ton of that myself and he gave me so much wise caring counsel in a way that only the most special people can do he told me stuff I didn't want to hear but I needed to know and he did so in a way that was kind and compassionate this past few days has been indicative of the times and very testing. I looked at my phone about 10 o'clock on Friday morning. There was nothing, N not the usual stuff that normally wastes my time on my phone. I looked again half an hour later and there were five or six messages and I thought that's unusual. And the people that were sending me messages also, that sphere was very, very uncommon. Some of the people have my number and really shouldn't have been contacting me. I scrolled down and I saw a message from James Pierce. Now, James, former BBC Olympic correspondent. And, you know, here's the sequence of events. James Brokenshaw trained me at university on the radio. I trained James Pierce and James has had a fantastic career and I couldn't have been happier for Portly as we call him when England won the ashes down under I think 2011 I called him in Sydney over the Christmas period and I just wanted to hear the atmosphere 
but I also wanted to congratulate him because great sports journalism encompasses great sport. And there, both of us are cricket fan. England had won the Ashes down under and one of my dear friends was reporting on it. Someone I trained after being trained by James Brokenshaw. And so James Pierce messaged me. And I looked at all of the messages on my phone and thought there's something strange here. And I knew instinctively to click on James Pierce's message first. And I wanted, I think I had that sixth sense. I wanted James Pierce to break the news to me as a dear friend and as Exeter alumni. I looked at my phone, I last messaged James Brokenshire on the 1st of September and I told him how much I loved him, how proud I was and how he had carried himself and I'm glad that I said those words to him in real time and not in after time. He replied that my words meant a lot to me and he was staying upbeat and you've just got to keep on keep it on. I messaged him about 10 days before his death and there was no reply and I feared the worst at that point. I think in fact 36 hours before I got the news I had a moment where I said I must go to London and see James. I knew I think. So when James Pierce messaged me the game was up and it was apparent and of course one's phone goes into overload you try and carry on with your day to a degree and i had to go into a four-hour conference call but of course that's suppressing emotion which is unhealthy and when i came out of it uh, well i didn't frankly stop crying for a couple of hours as i speak we don't know when the funeral will be I don't know if I will have security clearance to attend it. I don't go to every funeral of everybody that dies. I prefer to think of the great moments that I had with them when we were alive. My friend was a fantastic man. Integrity at the fore, warmth, consideration, love, at the heart of everything he did. He wanted to serve his country, which is not an emotion that I particularly have, and I think he did so brilliantly. If the cards had landed differently, he could have either been the main anchor of the Today programme on Radio 4 or Prime Minister. He certainly would have made an excellent Home Secretary. As it is at 53, um, he's gone, and Cathy his wife and three children must pick up the pieces. So James Brokenshaw, MP to you, James, matey boy to me, my friend, leaves us. And I suppose finally, after four years of thinking about it, encourages me to produce and deliver this very first podcast. I've joked with friends over the last few years that we might call this the dead good podcast in that we would see the good in those that were dead and hopefully it would be a dead good listen. I don't know if we'll be back soon, that's you and I, discussing somebody else. All I know is that we've all been through a hell of a time with COVID and people who should be outliving me are no longer staying the course. So I thank you for listening. I have been totally unscripted and from the heart. And I dedicate this episode to Kathy and to my dear friend James. And I'll sign off as I will do every time we do one of these. 
with those words once again you've just got to keep on keep it on thanks for listening